I am Adrian, I'm CTO for a company called Be Secure. Uh, we are focused on uh, ECG biometrics. So believe it or not, most people are familiar with uh, ECG collection, like the typical medical environment where you have a, an ECG recording machine and you've got 12 leads connected to your chest and the doctors are obviously using that to pick up the electrical signals and uh, analyze those signals to see if they can see a particular medical condition around the heart. But actually, Within those electrical signals, there's a pattern that's unique to each individual. And this is actually born out of a lot of medical research over the years, a lot of it actually uh, instigated by the Royal here in, in Northern Ireland. And then there's been multiple studies all over the world about this. So uh, we capitalize on that fact and we've been working on uh, various different solutions uh, for various different industries over the last few years. The company itself is actually about 10 years old. Uh, the history of the company is where uh, initially some hardware and some algorithms were developed uh, to try and do this in, in principle. Um, we tried to raise further investment back then, but this was before the likes of Touch ID and the, and the explosion of biometrics, which is starting to happen at the moment. So the recent sort of instigation of the company is only about two years old and we've uh, got a lot of traction. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, here we have a, a typical hacker. Uh, wearing a hoodie, of course. And when we sort of uh, talk about, you know, issues in cybersecurity and everything else, we're a lot of times thinking about remote access, uh, network vulnerabilities and everything else. What's actually sort of happening at the moment and where's the sort of with the explosion of Internet of Things is the concern about the physical attacks on, uh, on devices. So this is actually a builder trying to hack a computer. So we need to be careful about him. And even cats are at it to this. So what's the solution? Well, we can ban hoodies and we can ban cats, but one area in terms of cybersecurity is to focus on identity and access management. So there is an explosion of, of IoT connected devices. I think it's half a billion devices now in 2016 going to 26 billion by 2020. And of course, uh, the cybersecurity industry is very much focused on um, you know, network management software, uh, firewalls, antivirus. One area of focus that has to happen is this identity and access management and the actual security uh, and knowledge of the users of the physical devices within an enterprise. And this is really where we're focused uh, in, our, in our solutions. So why use ECG? What you see here, this uh, squiggly marker, you might... Uh, Find some familiarity if you remember what you see on, a, on an actual ECG recording machine in a, in a medical environment. But effectively what happens is every time your heart beats, an electrical signal is traveling throughout your body. And you can pick that signal up at various points. Obviously in a medical environment, you can pick that up at the chest and the signal is quite strong. But you can pick it up in other places, for example, at the fingertips, uh, head, even the small of your back. And the signal occurs by the uh, contraction or action of the heart every time it beats. And this is this leads to the, what's known as the PQRST complex, which is a very, very interesting signal. So every time your heart beats, some form of signal that looks like this occurs. Within the signal, it's quite interesting. Obviously, I've talked about the pattern that exists uh, that's unique to an individual, but there's a lot of other information in there as well. For example, there's information that you can harness about your emotional state. Let me, let me just explain that a little bit. This ST segment of the wave can vary quite a bit on each heartbeat, uh, depending on things like stress, fatigue, and mood. So if you couple pattern recognition with the ability to understand the health and wellness or the physiological condition of the individual, you've got something that's potentially beyond authentication. The signal itself, uh, in comparison to sort of traditional biometrics like fingerprint, facial recognition, iris scanning, you don't leave any latent signatures around of your ECG signal. You know, it's, people can sort of leave, it or leave a, a fingerprint on various different objects and, and it can be harnessed. Whereas an ECG signal is an internal biometric. Uh, it takes quite a lot of effort to harness it. The signal is very, very small in the first place. And one of the inherent advantages of, of its use is aliveness detection. So the beat itself is changing slightly from one beat to the next, which is very challenging from a technology development point of view, 
but brings a lot of advantages from a security point of view. It's known as intrabeat variability, but these slight changes in the beats are a very, very good indi indication when you, you're designing a product or a device to harness this uh, about, about knowing that, a, that actually a person is alive and is trying to use a device. Extremely flexible. So we are not a product company. We don't develop products. We're developing algorithms that can be deployed in various different industries and use cases. Um, what we've been experimenting with is creating algorithms that are able to detect the ECG signal uh, in the presence of noise, but also offer a range of different materials. So traditionally in a hospital environment, you would be using a wet electrode with conductive gel. Uh, we are doing demos at the moment where we can detect the signal of plastics, um, of glass with transparent coating. So you can imagine that could be the screen of an iPad or a phone. Uh, wearing fabrics, conductive fabrics, and being able to detect the signal. So quite a lot of very interesting applications, and uh, I'll talk a little about some of the projects we're working on uh, later on. So you can imagine it's quite cost effective. You don't need an expensive camera. You don't need silicon for a fingerprint scanner um, or, or iris detection. And it opens up a number of use cases. Um, for example, there's no reason why the, this laptop and the case around it a coating cannot be applied and it can be the sensing element for the ECG. So this opens up a number of opportunities for us as a company. I've uh, been able to deploy our algorithms into different people's product roadmaps. And if we take the, the example of the Internet of Things, it opens up the ability to add physical security to a number of different devices. I've already mentioned this, but within the signal itself, um, if you take if you do pattern recognition, but uh, you can also do things for heart rate variability, where you, you look at the statistical differences between the heartbeats, and that gives uh, indications of stress and fatigue. So it's very early days we're looking at this, uh, but it is something that's absolutely possible and brings another layer of security. Thanks. Let me bring this to life with a, a real life example of what we're, we're working at the moment. So. People have heard of the connected car and, and people are probably becoming aware that internet connectivity is, is coming to vehicles. Um, let me just sort of outline how ECG uh, biometrics could, could apply in this case. I'm not sure if some of you have heard of some of the headlines that have happened over the last couple of years, but uh, Chrysler vehicles, for example, have been remotely hacked. We've got driverless vehicles, which are, are going to obviously expand in their use. And there's a number of challenges with the use of these vehicles. For example, being able to detect if a person's really in the vehicle, uh, being able to deny hacking attempts remotely to the vehicle uh, and everything else. So here, here's a sort of an example of where this technology could be deployed. So in the first bit, we've got vehicle entry. So applying you know, uh, a coating to a, a key fob where it actually detects your ECG. And you know, at the moment, uh, if we take the likes of a Range Rover, I can pick up anybody's, the keys of anybody's Range Rover and just take it away with me. Whereas if your biometric template is stored on the actual key fob itself, then it's one extra form of security. Uh, imagine the person then actually gets into the vehicle, they sit down, they put their hands on the steering wheel. The steering wheel is actually a conductive element, conductive leather or whatever other type of material. It senses the ECG off the person, uh, doesn't pattern recognition match, uh, and then the vehicle allows you to start. So you can even bypass the key fob in the first place because you could also have applied these coatings to glass or the handle or, or whatever it is. Um, because the vehicle knows who you are, the personalization of the vehicle can all be set up so the seat can be adjusted, uh, various other settings in the car. The car will start for you. And one of the other uh, major advantages about this is as you're driving the vehicle, it can obviously detect that somebody's really alive in the vehicle from a driverless application, but driver well-being, so it continues to monitor your ECG. Uh, and there are signals within the ECG that come up in advance of, for example, the onset of fatigue. So that could, the vehicle could know that you're starting to get very tired, maybe adjust the driverless settings, um, give warnings or whatever. But it also opens up some interesting new use cases. For example, if the vehicle knows who you are, uh, then potentially you now can authenticate for payments. So this is a, an example of one of the projects we're involved with, with a, a financial uh, institution. So 
theoretically, you do not have to enter a PIN. You don't have to enter your credit card details. The vehicle knows it's you, and it becomes the vehicle for making a payment. So now we're using phones for payments, but one of the next big things that's going to happen within the connected car is the vehicle itself will allow you to make payments, especially the driverless vehicles. There's no reason why you can't be in your driverless vehicle and doing internet shopping. So the likes of Visa and MasterCard want to get a piece of this because they can get a, a piece of every payment that comes through, and as people are sort of shopping in their vehicle, then they will get a piece of this. And then also opens up, up the insurance use cases where if the insurance company knows that you are in that vehicle, it knows that you're the right person to be driving the vehicle, uh, and also even your physiological state, you can imagine that how, how uh, worthwhile that data is. That picture of a vehicle might give a clue of uh, one of the projects we're working on. Um, okay, so our vision is to have a suite of algorithms that are deployed via semiconductor companies and the development frameworks of the semiconductor companies um, into many different industries. Um, we are partnered now with one major global semiconductor company and they are deploying their microchips into a number of different industries, especially focused on IoT. And this would, ECG authentication will become a feature that as a developer you're, you're able to select as you're uh, working on a device. As, as regards us as a company, we're closing a new round of late seed investment and we're going for a Series A investment in 18 to 24 months. Uh, we have a number of exciting projects uh, underway. Our focus initially is in access control solutions, custom solutions for high security. Uh, this, little, this is a little card example of a prototype that we're working on for a particular company. Uh, the biometric template is stored on the card itself. Very, very secure and it will be piloted in a number of different uh, areas. Uh, the next major project is the semiconductor license in play, which we're doing. Uh, we are, as I say, closing this investment and we're opening up new offices in Belfast to expand and we'll be hiring locally. So that is the end of the overview. Any questions? Lots of questions. <laughs> you, said, sure. you said the solution is very secure or ultra secure. Uh, what does it mean in the numbers? So for example, the equal error rate of your solution? Yeah. So one of the one of the one of the issues and challenges that we have uh, as a company is trying to collect ECG data that's not your traditional medical data. We've taken in databases uh, of uh, uh, medical ECGs and we've ran them through our development fra frameworks and you're getting extremely good performance figures. All we've had to do is go out and create a development set off the fingers, for example. Um, we're we're actively collecting data, so we have a development set of about fifty people. Uh, and our equal, uh, our false accept rate zero percent, and false reject rate zero uh, percent for the development set. But what we are doing at the moment is now trying to collect lots and lots of data to confirm that level of performance. How long do you have to measure the ECG? So our target is to be less than five seconds, but uh, one beat is really uh, hypothetically what we need. It depends. Uh, the the biggest challenge that we have is actually the signal itself. If the signal is very good. It can it can react within one beat. If the signal is compromised for for whatever reason, maybe the, the design of the electrodes or the products takes a few heartbeats. So you know, if you take the access control example, maybe it's not the type of solution you deploy for just getting easily through a gate as you know hundreds of employees are coming through. But if you take example of a bank uh, or a data center where you wait a second or two for that. But at Harvey, it's a, it's a very secure solution. So we're running a number of pilots at the moment. One of the pilots is in a, a, a bank here in Belfast on the Treasury Room. It's a parallel security system to what they have already. Um, and uh, that has been deployed at the moment. Great, thanks. Thank you. Sounds like a cool fantasy to make electrodes to your hands and to stimulate uh, fake, fake ECG. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're affiliated with CSIT here locally. And um, of course, this is a very new technology very early technology, we want to make sure that uh, while we believe it's, it's, it is very secure and there's a number of reasons why, we want to make sure that we cover all bases from a, a system point of view, especially as we're not the ones who are going to be developing the products. You know, we'll be giving algorithms to those people who are developing the next generation of wearables uh, and mobile and everything else. You were next, sir. Um, you mentioned the unique package <coughs> signal. What are you looking for exactly in the changes in the amplitude? Yeah, yeah, great question. Let me just uh, jump back here. <coughs> so this PQRST complex here, 
the image we see here is in the time domain, and you can effectively take lots of complex measurements uh, of the different amplitude phases and everything else in the time domain, but we're also working in the frequency domain. So we, we sort of refer to it as a sort of a hybrid algorithm where it takes uh, data points and extracts features in the time domain on the fre frequency domain. Thank you. Okay. So, so how do you solve the curve like this, or if I have a heart attack, it doesn't change my actual... Uh, so um, the well, because there's two answers to that. The first answer is there's a the, within your heart there's a, a thing called a synatrial node, which is effectively the heart's natural pacemaker. So if you have to get uh, and that that creates the process of the the, the chambers um, contracting and relaxing. If you have a pacemaker, effectively that bit is taken out and it's replaced by the pacemaker that gener that helps the heart do that. So you would have to basically re-enroll. And uh, just to sort of explain that process, it's about 30, we collect normally about 30 to 40 seconds worth uh, of uh, ECG data from a person, take in each beat uh, and, and make a template from it. Um, if you had a heart attack or some major physiological event, more than likely, we haven't tested this because we haven't been able to make ourselves have a heart attack yet, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you would more than likely have to, to re-enroll. So the, the process of enroll is very similar to what you might be familiar with your fingerprint scanner. Where you take a number of measurements, you build up a template, and there's like a quality score that comes comes back to you. <laughs> we'll go to this side of the room here first. Um, I was wondering, like, you know, um, that, uh, some of the information you'll be taking there, particularly, say, in my mind, like in, in a car, um, yeah. as you're driving along and the TV comes along, would be very interesting to people like Google or advertising mm -hmm. agencies. Yeah. Um, oh, you want tire? Um, I bought Starbucks down the road. Like, yep, yep, good point. Um, yep. Have there been any, I don't know, focus groups that might um, have given back any feedback on how they feel about giving this extra kind of information, considering how people are starting to feel about the targeted advertising as it is? No, and uh, you know that's one particular use case of how you could use the data, and actually, you know. Here, here's where I'm personally conflicted. Where we're, we're you know, we're, we're developing a technology that has the capability to give you all this extra information that can be used for things like that, and yet I'm annoyed already with how much information is taken from me using my mobile. So, I think it's going to be one of those things where you you opt in or you don't. And, you know, if you choose to have that as a feature, we say that but we already have people tracking our phones, whether they want to I know. or not. It's more of an opt out thing. So um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a. I suppose a scary thought of that that information when available will be used by people and is there any I don't even know if there's data protection on that on that type of information yet and in real that's comes in real time even if it's discarded yeah. immediately yeah so we're having we've had a number of um, engagements uh, and some of our projects with um, the larger technology companies and What's definitely happening is there is going, you're going to see an increase in physiological measurements coming to everyday devices. So the likes of your next generation of Fitbits and, and uh, Google has released a new um, wearable, they are taking more than your standard PPG, you know, taking skin conductivity. You'll see ECG electrodes being put on you know, these new devices. That data is really, really powerful. And you'll see even the Apple Health app is more activity going on there. And, and, and so a lot of these companies are going to move into health monitoring. And we're sitting in a sort of, in a sort of <coughs> sideline to that where we're saying, right, okay, you're doing all that and that's very important data and you're going to use that whatever way you want to use it. But how do you know it's from the right the individual? And it opens up new use cases. So we're coming in from the authentication point of view. Really, it's up to the tech companies and how they use that data. And unfortunately, we're not going to have much control over that. But it is a, it's an area of uh, data protection, which is very new. In fact, biometrics generally, it's very new. There's been a lot of breaches of fingerprints, for example, and our focus has been to uh, have algorithms of the capability to just do everything running on a device as opposed to storing it on a network or a cloud. Yeah. Uh, you touched on it briefly before um, in the case of heart attacks, but mm -hmm. going a bit less extreme, you mentioned that pattern changes depend on stress, fatigue. Um, how can you? verify someone's authenticity if their patterns change based on their state of mind or say for instance they're on medication or something that affects their heart rate yeah. you know, is that going to keep them locked out of their devices as well no so what, what we're what we're doing is we're uh, we're applying machine learning techniques to sort of as a user 
continues to authenticate and use the device, it learns, I suppose, their different states. Um, completely reliant, if we completely relied on time-based measurements where you have you know, waveforms varying all over the place, it's very difficult to, to lock, lock on to a proper measurement. So again, that's why we're playing a lot in the frequency domain. And so what we're doing done sort of tests, like, you know, maybe you get someone to authenticate <coughs> at rest and then they do some exercise and then they yeah. try to authenticate again. Yeah. yeah. Does yeah. it still work? It, it still works. Does it work as well? No. And that's what we're, we're, we're still working on. So for example, in our, in our, um, our data collection strategy, we have people who are just in an everyday situation, sit, stand, uh, and then we have like an exercise subset where they're on an exercise bike and we're trying to do an authentication. But it's a little bit, you know, we have to sort of, we need, need to understand what the use case is because, you know, you're, if, you, if you've ever tried to authenticate on the go with an Apple iPhone trying to use your fingerprint and your finger's sweaty and everything else, it doesn't work too well. So we need to understand the use cases and where it's applied. We can't work in every situation. So. Is it difficult to just record the signal of someone and then log in or authenticate on the app? You mean like a replay attack? Yeah. Well, one of the one of the big advantages of of uh, of the fact is that the ECG signal itself is so small, so you need to be recording it for a, a quite a long period of time. Um, we're really relying on the the intra variability feature of the signal itself, where it's varying all the time. So consistent replay attacks uh, you could effect effectively figure out what's going on but it's it's a it's a level of development we haven't got to yet what we are focusing on right now is is developing the sensing element of it, the pattern recognition and then working with our, our own customers as they encrypt the template okay uh, on the uh, fingerprint scanner first came out of the iphone they realized pretty quickly you could use a cat's paw have you ever tried this with a dog or a cat or anything? No, I've, uh, I've tried it with my children, which is good fun. Um, but no, I haven't tried it with an animal. Um, the fingerprint journey is uh, <laughs> the fingerprint journey is quite quite interesting. Uh, some latest information coming out. You, you know, if you're uh, enrolling your fingerprint on, on a device, you put it on the device, but it asks you to roll your finger around. Well, it turns out a lot of the fingerprint companies are using just partial fingerprints, which aren't actually very secure, but yet they've been, you know, we're using mobile now for payment because it's incredibly convenient. But, you know, we don't know, for example, what the false accept, false reject rates of Apple are, and they're, they're such a big player. Um, so there will be vulnerabilities in every security, uh, every biometric, and there will be um, pros and cons with it, but we don't, we don't know what our competitors are up to. And we don't see fingerprint as competitive. It's very good for what it is. We're, we're just coming in with different use cases and different aspects of it. Are you are we okay to have yeah, one? You can, yeah, you can answer a couple more questions. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. So you said uh, you use the information from a, like, a natural pacemaker of a heart. Mm -hmm. And is there a notable difference between like, this normal pacemaker and the uh, artificial one? So can you take the difference? Because if you could forge the um, ECG from another person by using, a, I know it's really far fetched, but an artificial, uh, like a pacemaker, to fake his ECG, is it possible or? I think tech, technically or it's possible feasible. to use like a, for example, a, an arbitrary waveform generator to try and generate an ECG, but the complexities in this signal, as <coughs> you're, this signal has been generated by the, the physiological me mechanism that's going on. And one of the reasons that it's different from, from you versus I is our heart size is different, with genetic differences, the organs around it are different. All these things are, are, are a feature you could I think you can artificially create a, a heartbeat. The question is, is it, it is it going to be enough to spoof a system, or is it going? To, you know, can I recreate yours? And more than likely, I, I wouldn't be able to. But this is, and again, you know, we're in early technology. This is a level yeah, of testing we need to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if somebody was suffering from alertness and um, were to get a heartbeat, how much would that affect the intricacies of that signal? Uh, of a, of a good story on that, um, we ran, we've run a number of pilots, as I say, mainly focused on access control. Um, one of the guys who, and we are not uh, focusing on health, but one of the guys who were using it, they were using a sort of a little card like this. We turned the card into like a recorder so you could see how it was working and then that was feeding back into our algorithm development. You could actually see that he had an arrhythmia condition 
just from the, the data we had. So, you know, he had signed up to be part of this study, but we were able to sort of say to him, the, the system worked, the card worked. I mean, at the end of the day, there was a pattern in each of those beats as they came in. They don't necessarily need to be in perfect order, but there's a pattern there. But we were able to sort of feed back and go, you know, get yourself checked out. But but now we're, for for us deploying this and licensing this, we don't, we do, we do not want to get into that space. As you know, we need to be you know, medically approved in Europe and the US. There are people who do that. There's a very interesting company called Alive Corps, uh, who've signed a contract with the NHS and they're utilizing little devices you apply to your mobile and everything else where you take recordings and then it will automatically give you a warning if you've got a heart condition. So this is again another example of the uh, sort of technology uh, which would have been you know, big pacemakers or pacemakers, big ECG recorders are now coming to everyday devices including blood pressure monitoring and everything else. Okay. Yeah. 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 by combining it with other biometrics? So like you mentioned you could put this as a coating on a piece of glass or something. Yeah. Could you combine it with, say, a fingerprint reader, or even I think there's a company in Japan that's working on uh, biometric for subway terminals, which reads your blood vessels in your thumb, which mm -hmm. is even more unique than a fingerprint and can't be copied essentially. Yeah. So, have you thought about competing technology and potentially using them in combination with yours? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And, you know, I think really the future of security as regard biometrics is multimodal and, and creating use cases and opportunities where, you know, you can deploy or whatever. So it could be fingerprint. OK, I can't match the fingerprint. Maybe I'll also detect ECG as a backup or an additional security feature for liveness detection as an example. So, yes, we're, uh, we're having some conversations around that. Um, we have some ideas of, as you say, sort of a, the actual design of the fingerprint sensor could actually be a sensing element for ECG as well as the, the image. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much for the question.